we'll get started. So thank you everybody for who's here for joining today. Um, being joined by Jason Tremblay from Triangle Tube, uh, Kevin Key from Triangle Tube, uh, Tito Melendez from Triangle Tube. Uh, Jason's going to help out um, here today. Um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the uh, the, the chat feature of uh, of Zoom. Um, so if not, look for your chat button. If you've got questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Jason's going to be over here to answer those questions for you uh, as we go along. Um, hope everybody is um, uh, safe and healthy. A uh, lot uh, going on in our world today. So uh, appreciate you being on. Um, really the, the uh, idea of today's meeting is to review uh, a, an update to the smart tank. So those of you that have been around uh, for a while with Triangle 2, we've certainly gone through some uh, changes with the smarter what, what, what once was phase three a lot of years ago um, so we are again under the direction of group atlantic our parrot company um, you know uh, continuing to improve on products so uh, we, we just recently launched um, what we call the smart 316 so the 316 uh, is uh, we're referring to the metal that's being used now so the the Smart tank for a lot of years has been is used a 304 stainless steel uh, is going now to a 316 stainless steel, uh, but there's other product improvements as well, uh, including uh, a change to the warranty policy. So um, we just want to get everybody up to speed on that. Um, for those of you that are new, um, that's a good opportunity to learn about the smart tank. It's, a, it's been a great product for Triangle Tube for many, many years, and um, we're just uh, making it better um, today. So uh, moving along here, if my technology will, will work. Um, so really the improvements are the you know, 316 uh, uh, L inner tank. So gone to a change in the material. I'll talk about, you know, specifically what the differences are in 304 and 316 L and how it benefits uh, you and your customers. So that's the inner tank. Um, all of the connections, all the stainless steel connections on, on uh, domestic water are now also use the same 316L. Using a process called acid pickling to provide even more corrosion resistance to the material. We'll, we'll talk about what that is. Um, uh, completely sealed waterproof top cover. Um, so those again, so they've been a, around for a while. Uh, there were uh, some, some history of uh, issues with, where we've got water on top of the tank through a leak or something like that. So again, just kind of improved on that, improved the dry well, um, upgraded welding processes and uh, improved on our warranty. So if you can improve on a lifetime warranty, tell me how you do that. Well, I'm going to tell you. So again, just looking at the tank, right, going to the inner tank, the outer tank is still a carbon steel tank, right? So that's in, uh, not in contact with domestic water. Uh, anything that's in contact with domestic water is now gone to a 316L, the inner tank uh, and all of the connections and all, any, all of the, the stainless material goes through this acid pickling process as well to add to the corrosion resistance. So just kind of taking a look, look at the top of the tank. So upgrades, again, the 316 nipples, the top of the tank for domestic water connections, uh, an improved dry well. Uh, I, again, I'll get a little more detail as we go. Uh, and then the, the top of the tank being completely sealed. So looking at uh, you know, the, the, the layout of the boiler, for those of you who are new to SMART and those of you that are familiar with the tank, well, this is review time for you. And I just kind of want to go over um, you know, those, those features of the tank that have really made SMART a, a high performing product for a lot of years. So um, starts with top connections. So um, on, the, on the domestic water side, so most of our water connections in, in applications in North America are in, in basements. So obviously the water connections are coming from the ceiling down, the ceiling down so it is a more uh, convenient uh, place to pipe. Um, uh, an integral aquastat, so all tanks come with an aquastat uh, integral to them. Uh, we still sell a lot of tanks up in the northeast uh, and, and down in the mid-Atlantic region um, alongside 
uh, oil-fired boilers as well. So having that integral aquastat makes uh, change out easy and, um, you know, and more cost effective as well. It's just hook up thermostat wire directly to that control. Um, side connections for your uh, boiler piping, right? So uh, ease of installation, not crowded on top of the tank. Um, because we don't use a coil design, there's a, there's a much uh, lower pressure loss on the boiler side. Uh, so water flow from the boiler flowing through the, through the tank um, meets a lot less resistance, which means you can use smaller pumps or even using the same pump, you're gonna get better flow rate, which means you're gonna get better heat transfer through here. Um, very large heat transfer surface with this inner corrugated tank, so tank and tank design, um, the stainless steel 316 tank inside of an outer carbon steel tank. Um, and that corrugation actually gives you a, a descaling feature. So as the tank moves, as it heats and cools and expands and contracts, it will help prevent scale from forming on the tank, which is over a period of time is going to reduce heat transfer and cut down on the efficiency. So talking a bit about stainless steel, right? So um, <clears throat> quick lesson in, in stainless steel. So <clears throat> stainless steel is basically, it, it's a, um, it's a, uh, an alloy product. So it's composed of iron ore and additional uh, materials added to that, right? So uh, a minimum of 11% chromium added to iron ore, right, in a, in a molten process to produce stainless steel, right? And then you have different types of stainless steel depending upon what type of elements you add. So some of the elements that you might add could be um, aluminum, silicone, uh, titanium, copper, um, niobium, and one, uh, one material in particular is uh, molybdenum, which we show on here. So that's what uh, the kind of the key ingredient to a 316 stainless, and there's a reason why. So just kind of, you know, uh, as we've started talking about making a change to 316L, the questions come up, uh, you know, hey, what's the difference between 304 and 316? So uh, that's why we're presenting that today. Right? So 304 stainless uh, contains high nickel and high chromium content. Right? Um, you know, the rest of the, the, the composition of 304 stainless is predominantly iron. Um, so the high amounts of chromium, uh, chromium and nickel give 304 um, very, very good corrosion protection. Um, the difference with 316 is the addition of molybdenum. So this was the element that I had talked about. So in order to be called 316, you have to have a minimum of uh, a 3% by weight um, uh, of molybdenum in, your, uh, in the composition uh, uh, of the alloy. Right, so this uh, higher molybdenum content, which is a very strong uh, corrosion, corrosive material uh, against certain types of water chemistry, uh, produce a much uh, uh, better resistant product to different types of water conditions. So we'll talk about that. Kind of another way to look at it here is, you know, stainless steel 304 on the left and 316 on the right. You know, the makeup is very, very similar. 304 is used in, it's the most widely used stainless steel for all types of applications, not just, uh, you know, uh, water heaters or, or water applications, but, um, you know, uh, venting systems. They're used in um, the automotive industry and exhaust systems. So there's, uh, it's very, you know, high temperature, high corrosion resistant. By adding the molybdenum uh, to that, we get corrosion protection against, um, you know, other types of water chemistry. Right? And most namely, um, uh, against <clears throat> chlorides in water. So when we start talking about water, um, so you've got chlorides that exist. So these are, these are uh, salts in solution and they either happen naturally, you know, it can happen, you know, through the, through the ground, depending upon the region that you're in, in uh, areas where you get a lot of, uh, you know, where we have a lot of snow, we have high snowfall and they're using salts to melt snow in areas, um, sea coast areas, you know, those, those salts make their way into uh, the groundwater. 
Um, so, yeah. and, they're, and they're very corrosive. So the 316L adds to that corros uh, corrosive resistance. Right? Um, and then in some areas, chlorine is actually added to water supplies. Um, so again, uh, 304 is a very strong material in, in a lot of uh, scenarios. Um, it's more than adequate to handle um, you know, your water conditions, um, but there are um, uh, regional and localized water conditions that may not hold up so well to, uh, you know, to even uh, 304. So we've, you know, taken the decision to, uh, you know, produce the highest quality product uh, that we could to kind of make sure that we cover all of these uh, possible scenarios for water conditions out there. Uh, but the L in, in 360, just for instance, again, this is a question that came up, um, just for your information, stands for low carbon. So it's a low carbon uh, type of, uh, of steel to start with, right? So it helps resist corrosion. Um, then we go into the acid pickling process, right? So some of you guys may have heard the process of passivation um, of uh, stainless steel materials or, or metals. Um, acid pickling is very similar. It does provide uh, it passivates the stainless, but it uses um, you know, a stronger chemical and kind of uh, gets into a, a much deeper uh, layer of um, uh, oxide protection. Kind of show you some pictures here to, to help that make sense, right? So <clears throat> um, we talked about stainless steel having chromium added to it, right? That chromium um, naturally forms a protective layer against the stainless steel. So if you see the picture on the right here, this middle layer, this chromium layer, it, it occurs naturally uh, through the manufacturing process, right? But then when we take and we go through um, uh, further manufacturing, so that's the kind of uh, the, the molten level of, of producing the product, but then we start to talk about um, you know, welding the product, right? So once you once you go to welding the surface, then you're going to break down that chromium layer and you're going to leave deposits. And you're going to leave um, a scale oxide layer on the material itself. So the idea of pickling is to restore that uh, chromium oxide layer back to its uh, natural state. So uh, the picture on the top on the left hand side, you see the before pickling. So this is after um, this piece was welded. Right? You can see what it looks like. So there's contaminants now that have taken away that uh, oxide, that chromium oxide layer and produced this, this uh, scale layer. And then after pickling, we completely cleaned up the material and not just cleaned it, this chromium oxide layer will um, uh, naturally reproduce itself. Right? So, so steel pickling refers to the treatment that is used to remove uh, the surface impurities, rust, and scale from the surface, the material exposing uh, a fully alloyed stainless steel surface. Uh, in order to remove the scale oxide layer, the material is dipped into a vat of what is called pickling acid, right? So using different acids, and really the difference between passivation and um, pickling is that uh, passivation uses milder uh, acids to clean the surfaces and they really don't result in as uh, deep a layer of the chromium of the chromium oxide. So pickling uh, adds to overall corrosion resistance. Here's a kind of another way to look at this, right? The, uh, the, the uh, image on the left hand side, right, shows you here's your stainless steel on the bottom. So you saw your stainless steel layer. And then this chromium oxide layer that's, you know, naturally occurring is basically a protective layer against uh, oxygen um, from corroding the stainless steel. When you start to cut and weld the material, you expose, right, that bare um, stainless material and you, and you um, take away that outer chromium oxide layer. So getting back to this last picture on the right, um, so after we've machined uh, and manufactured the material by uh, using this acid pickling process, we can restore that, um, that naturally forming protective chromium oxide layer to the material. So it's not just the, the material you're using, it's also you know, the manufacturing processes that you're using here. Um, other changes to the smart tank uh, are the, the cutting process of so going to a new orbital cutting process that just makes sure that we've got clean openings in the, uh, in the tank anywhere that it's welded. 
so that you know you get you, there's no uh, issue with uh, leaks that could form around wells, especially where the inner tank um, penetrates the outer tank. Um, welding process has been uh, been improved too uh, by applying a method uh, of uh, using uh, backing gases uh, into the welding process as you prevent. Uh, contaminants from getting into your actual welds that are become weak points, right? So uh, going to a, a a better welding process has improved or uh, reduced the risk of having an issue with the seams, right? So you've got the material for one and then you've got, you know, seams or anywhere we're cutting material and, and adding welds to it. So those tend to be weak points. So using the, the best uh, processes and techniques available um, when manufacturing. So other improvements, we talked about the top of the tank. Um, those, again, those of you that have uh, been using or familiar with the smart tank for a lot of years, you, you, you know, there, there was a time where uh, we used to ship the tank with a, a float vent on the top of the tank. You've got, you know, the outer tank is basically effect, effectively boiler water. And in order to get the air out of that tank, um, you know, we've got to, we've got to have the way to purge that. So in the past, um, we use a float vent and over, over time that float vent could leak and it was not maintained. Um, and those leaks down on the top of the tank could eventually make its way into the uh, the foam insulation and eventually onto the carbon steel and rot the tank out. So um, basically gone to a, one, we use a, uh, uh, a manual air vent to bleed the tank. So once we've got the tank bled, we can just close that, that vent down right at the top of the tank, but also made sure that all of the, the seals, the discussions around all the nipples and the aquastat uh, are all completely watertight now. Uh, we've gone through uh, testing where we've poured water on top of the tank for extended yeah. periods of time, more so than you would ever see in actual um, installation, and uh, the tank is uh, is waterproof. Uh, so improved dry well. So uh, again, we've went, gone through a period where we were ha you know, had some leaks on the dry well on the tank, which caused you know problems, obviously. Um, you know, uh, so gone to a new supplier to produce the, the well for us, but also a uh, testing procedure where we're testing um, the integrity of every well before it goes into the tank. Um, dip tubes are now, and they, they have been for a while, but just to point that all, they're all made out of a PEX material, so they're very strong and, and um, uh, cor corrosion resistant. Um, this slide really I want to talk a little bit about um, using corrosion inhibitors in, in systems in general. Um, you know, because we're we're talking about a, a, a carbon steel outer tank. Um, you know, having air in the system. I mean, if you had, you know, let's say a worst case where you had, um, let's say, a, a oxygen, um, no oxygen barrier on tubing. So there's there's some systems in different parts of the country, either you know older polybutylene, original, some of the original PEC stuff, uh, even some of the rubber products used in radiant systems didn't have an oxygen barrier, and they're still used today, um, you know, uh, PEX tubing without an oxygen barrier, um, do, would not recommend uh, those products being used with this tank. Under normal circumstances, normal conditions, you know, it's a closed loop system, you know, we're getting air out of the system, there's, no, there's not an issue, um, but, um, you know, one protective measure that you can take for the entire system, for the boiler, uh, you know, for all of your piping, for your, your heat emitters, everything is the use of inhibitors in the system. Um, we're pointing out a couple of different manufacturers here, but really to, you know, protect against not to, more so than just um, oxygen in the system because these inhibitors can reduce the amount of oxygen in the system. It's part of what they do, um, but it can also prevent scale uh, build up in the system because you're, you know, anytime you've got dissimilar metals in the system, you're going to have galvanic corrosion um, and this will uh, help prevent that so that uh, your ferrous metals in the system don't do, you know, degrade over a period of time and, you know, they, they turn to sludge and magnetite 
Um, and, and when they do, then you've got to heat that, you've got to heat through it, you get scale on heat emitters, you get scale on boilers, you've got to heat through that, they act as insulators, so it reduces efficiency of the system as well. And you think about, um, you know, that, that sludge in your system that gets circulated through, through circulators, you know, through, through uh, valves that will foul up, um, you know, valves and pumps and stuff like that. So it's really, you know, uh, to protect everything in the system. Um, and also just from a, from an, uh, an efficiency standpoint too, looking at maintaining system efficiency over a long period of time by keeping heat emitters clean, by keeping, uh, boilers clean as well. Um, and we talked about, uh, you know, preventing uh, failure of pumps and, and valves in the system uh, as well. Uh, reduce and, uh, redu uh, reduces long-term maintenance costs uh, as well for obvious reasons. Um, and all these materials are, are non-toxic and environmentally friendly as well. So, um, 316, uh, Smart 316, um, I, I put this slide, these are the specs on the sizes. I'm not going to go through all of this in great detail, but just want you to be aware that um, this affects all models. So nothing's changed in terms of what we um, offer in a range of products. So from uh, 30 gallon up to 120 gallon tank, right? So no change to specification in terms of, you know, physical dimensions, um, height, weight, diameter. Um, so no, nothing's changed there. All these specifications are available online and in our literature. Um, so if you wanna, this is pulled right off of our literature here. So just a, Quicker, quick look at the uh, the design of the tank and tank for those of you that may be new to uh, the smart tank and tank and tank design. Uh, this is something that is unique to Triangle Tube. It's been on the market for well over 30 years in, in, uh, in North America. Uh, products been produced in Europe for uh, a much longer period of time. But um, rather than using a coil to transfer heat, we use a uh, an inner tank here. Um, Azure as your heat exchanger. So you've got boiler water on the outside. So, right? so we've got um, a, su a supply and return actually um, on the left-hand side, right? So that, that hot water coming with the boiler is gonna surround uh, the inner tank and heat the water on the inside. So you've got your domestic water uh, outlet here on the hot side, on the left-hand side. And then you've got your cold water coming in on the right side through a dip tube that is going to bring that water down to the bottom of the tank. Uh, the tank does ship with a second dip tube. If you wanted to use uh, the, uh, this auxiliary port here uh, for recirc, so that you are recently were bringing that recirc water to the bottom of the tank, that's what that's there for as well. If we want to bring that that recirculated water down to the bottom of the tank and not just bring it right, you know, back up to the top where it can recirculate back out the hot side of the tank. Um, you see your, um, your dry well here. So this is a sensor located down the bottom uh, of this well. And again, for those are, that are new to Triangle Tube, that Aquastack gets shipped standard uh, installed in the boiler. If you're using a uh, Triangle Tube uh, Instinct boiler or Prestige boiler along with your tank and you want to use the sensor that comes with the boiler, you simply remove the Aquastat, take the capillary tube out and insert the sensor down into the bottom of the well here. Um, so uh, kind of a, if I'd use my, uh, my, my PowerPoint presentation, it would tell us all this stuff, right? Um, and then you've got your vent at the top of the tank. So another look here in terms of uh, kind of operation from a cold start, right? We fill up the internal tank with uh, domestic cold water. The outside of the tank is filled with boiler water. Um, as we start to, to heat, the hot water from the boiler is gonna surround the tank right, and heat the inner water in the tank. Once it's completely up to temperature, then we're gonna shut the pump off and then talking about being in service. So as you start to draw hot water from the tank, then we're going to bring cold water uh, via a dip tube down into the bottom of the tank, right? So you're gonna get uh, stratified water temperature inside the tank. 
Um, so uh, getting onto the warranty portion of the show, right? So we talked about in, you know, improving a, a lifetime warranty, right? So our warranty, we recently launched a warranty uh, back last fall with the Instinct and Prestige boilers that kind of took things a, a step further than just warranty team product. We were actually you know, warranting the installation. So it's kind of um, rewarding best practices. Um, uh, on the installation side. So um, you can increase your warranty from the standard warranty by uh, just a, a, you know, a couple of couple of different steps. So I'll show you what that looks like here, the big reveal. Right. So our, so kind of think of it as a good, better, best uh, platform. So lifetime warranty um, is standard, comes that way. Uh, out of the box, uh, there's no requirement to the installer or the homeowner other than purchase and installation. Right? Along with that comes a, a one-year parts warranty and uh, no labor um, expressed with that. Right? So taking that to a, to a, and that's actually one thing I wanted to explain too as far as the warranty goes. Our warranty policy internally is that if you have a tank that leaks, if you're the original homeowner, so the warranty goes the original homeowner, right? It also goes, uh, it also um, based on the uh, a first failure. So if that tank fails for the first time, whether that's, uh, you know, in a year or whether that's in, in 10 years or 15 years, if that tank fails for the first time and you're the original homeowner, you can rest assured that you have a warranty. There's kind of a no questions asked policy. Uh, all we ask for is that, you know, the, the, you're the original homeowner and this is the first time you've had a leak. If you've had subsequent leaks, right, this is a second failure uh, of a tank, um, you know, at that point, we're probably going to want to you know, start to look closer at the, the application to see if it might be, you know, something on site. It doesn't say that you, uh, that you won't get a warranty because it certainly could be uh, a defect in, in manufacturing, but we also want to take a look at it. Is this a water condition? Is it, you know, uh, a site condition of some sort that's causing that? But that, you know, first time you have a leak, original homeowner, it's a no questions asked policy, right? Um, so this is the standard warranty out of the box, no registration required. Um, the, the, the next level of warranty <clears throat> would be to take you up to a one-year parts and a $500 labor allowance should you have to replace that tank within the first year. So if there's a manufacturing defect, that tank leaks within the first year, we will pay a $500 labor allowance to replace that tank. The only requirement for this is to register the product. So that can be registered by the consumer or it can be registered by the installer. To go to the best warranty, we're then going to take this <clears throat> tank um, to a six-year part and a $500 labor allowance up to the first three years of installation. So tank, for whatever reason, uh, fails in the first three years, we will pay a $500 labor allowance in writing and offer parts warranty up to six years. The requirement for this is to install. When you install the tank with a triangle tube boiler at the same time, so any triangle tube boiler, register both products under the, the uh, boiler best practice installation, which means you need to upload a picture of the combustion analysis, uh, that will, that installation would then qualify for this six-year parts uh, and three-year labor allowance. So um, we started talking about 316 earlier in the year. We kind of had a, a soft launch of the product at, um, at uh, AHR. Uh, earlier in the year, really talking about uh, the product at that point and kind of letting people know what was coming. Um, as this is a product upgrade and not a new product, it's kind of a rolling change. Um, so we've, we've been shipping some of the, the 316 products uh, since uh, uh, early May. Um, some models, maybe even late April, started to, to trickle out the door, and you wouldn't know it. The, the, the packaging, outside packaging, is is no difference. I'll show you the, the packaging in a second here and what the plan is longer term. But as of May 1st, um, any installation uh, would fall under the new warranty program, whether that was the uh, the older smart tank or the new smart 316 tank. All right, it doesn't matter. Um, 
uh, you know, which, which tank it was. It's going to be based on a, uh, an installation date. So if you've done installations uh, since May 1st, you would qualify under this new program as well. So you go back and take a look if, if you've installed anything in the last month or so, um, it would qualify under this program. Um, so again, as part of the contractor best program or best level, if you're familiar with the boiler program, you know, it offers a uh, six year parts, three year labor allowance in addition to the 10 year um, heat exchanger warranty. And so for those contractors that uh, qualify for that best level on the boiler and tank, um, they are added to our uh, find a contractor feature on our website. So consumers that are going to our website in your area looking for an installer or service contractor, um, you will automatically be listed on the website. Um, lastly, we just want to talk about labeling. The tank itself does come with a, a new uh, logo, new emblem on it. So uh, you can clearly see he's got the Smart 316 uh, label on here. Uh, the packaging initially does not have uh, any change to it, with the exception of um, this, this little label right here that says uh, 316 on the side of it, 316L. So if you see that, you know that's a, a, an upgraded tank. Um, or updated tank. Um, the, the longer term plan is to go to a different package. So future packaging will um, show the, uh, the Smart 316 logo. Right now we're looking at uh, what looks like an August launch with the new packaging. But again, as this is a rolling change for us, the uh, uh, product's been launched in, in phases um, to, uh, to allow you know, time for distribution to sell through uh, inventory and for Triangle Tube to move through inventory as well. Uh, but just to, to reiterate, the, uh, uh, the warranty change affects uh, is applies to all of the tanks and not just the uh, the new 316 tank. Um, so again, uh, August time frame, uh, you'll start to see a change in the, the actual packaging itself of the tank. Um, pretty much uh, what we had prepared for you today. So uh, I thank you again, everybody, for, for being on.